Welcome back. Well, in just one minute, we're going to go to an interview that Alex conducted with Susanna Hupp. But before we do that, we're going to go to a video that shows Mrs. Hupp speaking to members of Congress. It's extremely powerful. I didn't grow up in a house with guns. I don't hunt. I personally abhor hunting. But I was given a gun by a friend when I was 21 to carry in my purse for self-defense, and I was taught how to use it. A couple of years ago, my parents and I went to a cafeteria in Texas on a bright sunny day. We weren't in a dark alley where we weren't supposed to be. And as you all know the story, this madman drove his truck through the window, and he began shooting. Well, immediately, my father and I got down on the floor and put the table up in front of us. And this guy kept shooting. And you're thinking, what, you know, what could it be? Is it, is it a robbery? That's the first thing that generally comes to mind. And he keeps shooting. It took me a good 45 seconds to realize that this man wasn't there to commit a robbery. He wasn't there for a hit. He was there to simply shoot as many people as he possibly could. Now, I'd like to make something clear. I hear all this talk about how many bullets can go in a clip. I've been there. I can tell you it doesn't matter. It takes one second to switch out a clip. You can have one bullet or a hundred bullets. It doesn't matter, guys. I've been there. He goes, dump, dump, just like that. That's not enough time to rush a man. I promise you. When I finally realized what was occurring, I thought, I got him. And I reached for my purse. He was maybe 12 feet away. You know, is it possible my gun could have jammed? Sure. Is it possible I could have missed? Sure. But I can tell you I've hit much smaller targets at much greater distances. But then I realized that a couple of months earlier I had made the stupidest decision of my life. I took my gun out of my purse and left it in my car. Because as you well know, in the state of Texas, it's sometimes a felony offense to carry a gun in your purse. I can tell you that I'm not mad at the guy that did this. As he continued, it was obvious that he was a madman. My father at that point said, I'm gonna, I, I've got to do something, I've got to do something. He's going to kill everybody in here, and he rushed the man. No way. This guy turned, shot him in the chest. He went down, uh, was obviously mortally wounded. For whatever reason, that made the man change directions and go off to my left. Shortly thereafter, someone at the back of the restaurant broke out a window. When I saw what looked like an opportunity to escape, I turned around and I grabbed my mother by the shirt and I said, come on, come on, we've got to run, we've got to get out of here. And then my feet grew wings and I was out the back window. As soon as I got out, I realized that my mother had not followed me out. And as I learned from the police officers, she had crawled over to where my father was and cradled him until the guy got back around to her, put the gun to her head. She looked up at him, put her head down, and he pulled the trigger. My parents had just had their 47th wedding anniversary. She wasn't going anywhere. As I mentioned, I'm not really mad at the guy that did this. And I'm certainly not mad at the guns that did this. They didn't walk in there by themselves and pull their own triggers. The guy that did it was a, a, a lunatic. That's like being mad at a, a rabid dog. I'm mad at my legislators for legislating me out of the right to protect myself and my family. I would much rather be sitting in jail with a felony offense on my head and have my parents alive. As far as these so-called assault weapons, you say that they don't have any defense use. You tell that to the guy that I saw on a videotape of the L.A. riots, standing up on his rooftop, protecting his property and his life from an entire mob with one of these so-called assault weapons. Tell me that he didn't have a legitimate self-defense use. Just one final statement. I'm, I've been sitting here getting more and more fed up with all of this talk about these pieces of machinery having no legitimate sporting purpose, no legitimate hunting purpose. People, that is not the point of the Second Amendment. 
The Second Amendment is not about duck hunting. And I know I'm not going to make very many friends saying this, but it's about our rights, all of our rights, to be able to protect ourselves from all of you guys up there. That was an extremely powerful video. And now we're going to go to the one-on-one -on -one interview that Alex conducted with Mrs. Hupp. And I wanted to get her on the air because she was instrumental nationwide testifying before legislatures everywhere, not just the Texas legislature that she later chaired committees on, to get concealed carry in. And we've seen 25, 30 percent or more reductions in every state that's done it. So she'll be joining us at the bottom of the hour uh, here in just a moment. Here is just a short excerpt of her testimony uh, before Congress. The Second Amendment is not about duck hunting. And I know I'm not going to make very many friends saying this, but it's about our right, all of our right, to be able to protect ourselves from all of you guys up there. <laughs> Man, uh, and, and boy, that was what, back in the mid-1990s, and here we are in 2013. Great way to kick off the new year with a champion of liberty, who uh, I've got to say, if any one person got concealed carry in, you can say what you want about it turning a right into a privilege, the point is, is that it put guns on the street in law-abiding citizens' hands, and the criminals are keeping their heads down. Violent crime down over 20% nationwide on average since then. We've shown the new FBI statistics, except in areas where they've taken the guns, crime is up. Uh, former representative, uh, talk show host on 590 AM, you name it, uh, best-selling author. Um, uh, Mrs. Hupp, good to have you on with us. Hey, happy new year to you, Alex. Well, I am excited. I, what do you? What's your take on everything that's happening uh, and the open calls now in the Feinstein bill to physically make you turn guns in? It's a scary thing, isn't it? I, you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of friends of mine who, who we all kind of talk big. You know, you hear the, the from my cold, dead fingers comments. But the truth of the matter is, if a bunch of jackbooted thugs show up at my door, and put a gun to my child's head and says, turn over all your guns or else, I'm probably going to turn over my guns. You know, so I think it's really important, and I think this is why so often uh, revolutions um, uh, are mostly about young people and young people without extended families. You know what I mean? Um, it's, it's a scary world right now. It certainly is, but there's 160 plus million gun owners. If 1% fight back, that's 1.5 million soldiers. Uh, I agree, most people are going to turn them in, at least in the first wave, but the tyranny that follows is going to result in a civil war. And if you notice all the branding of Obama as the new Lincoln and how he's going to kick the butt of the states, it's pretty creepy. It's, it is. It's very frightening. And, uh, you know, when I talk about people turning in their guns, I think there are awful lot of people that are going out of their way to purchase guns that don't have a track record, you know, that, that, are, that uh, can't be traced to them. And those guns are going to be hidden and buried all over the place. And, um, um, you know, we might, be, we might be some of those people. Alex, you, you and I are going to be the first doors that they knock on. You're right. They're going to try to make examples of people. Why do you think, uh, for listeners that just joined us, we have the clip, Diane Feinstein and others are saying, Mr. and Mrs. America, get ready to turn your guns in. Why do I think she's doing that? I think because she's, she's absolutely clear that she has the backing of the president, and she now has, um, I would say, 70% of the media firmly behind her. You know, I was, I was actually sitting uh, getting a manicure a few days ago, and there was a lady kind of across from me, somebody I didn't know at all, and she got to talking about the guns and the, the shooting in Connecticut, and she turned to me and said, well, I just think we should get rid of all the guns. What do you think? Of course, that was a mistake, right? No, I, I, I took it very easy on her, and I didn't tell her any of my background or anything. And I, I simply said, well, you know, I've thought about it, and it seems to me that not one single one of these mass shootings has ever occurred where guns were allowed. And she stopped and she kind of blinked and she got up and she went and washed her hands and then came back and sat down and looked at me and she said, you know, I never thought about that, but you're right. So I think, I think there are an awful lot of people that out there that you can't grab with statistics. You can't grab with, with logic. I think there are a lot of people out there that you have to 
put them in the position of being, you know, as, as close as you can, put them, put them mentally in the position of being completely helpless. And then ask them if they would rather have somebody with them, even if they choose not to have a gun, if they would rather have somebody with them that knows how to use one or not. You know, even if they won't defend themselves, most people will are willing to defend their child. So I, I, I do my best to talk about that sort of thing. I know it's hard for you to talk about it, but you do to save other lives. And I've got to commend you again, as you know, and people can pull up the uniform crime statistics. Since concealed carry became ubiquitous in most states, crime rates on average around 24 to 25 percent. Uh, national, it's only about 20 because of some of the gun-free zones like Chicago and New York. But the Luby's massacre was a mass murder that took place October 16th, 1991 in Colleen, Texas, United States, uh, when George uh, Hennard... Uh, crashed his pickup truck through the front window, got to ban pickup trucks, on a Luby's cafeteria and shot 50 people, killing 23. Uh, exchanged shots with responding officers and then hid in a bathroom and fatally shot himself. Uh, you were there. You lost your parents. I know it's tough to talk about, but we've now seen fathers that lost children in the last few shootings come out and say, don't use this to take people's guns, but the media uh -huh. tries to ignore them. Uh, you as a survivor, I mean, you more than anybody have a right to lay out the record. Can you, for people that don't know, describe uh, what happened and what would have happened if you would have had a firearm? Uh, well, to try to keep it brief for you folks, um, my, my parents and I, I was about 31, I think, at the time, um, where I just dated myself. My parents and I had gone to a local cafeteria, and we were actually eating with the manager of the cafeteria place was packed. It was boss's day. It was uh, the day after payday. Middle of the day, beautiful day. And um, this guy drove his truck through the window. It was a floor-to-ceiling window and crashed into a number of tables and came to a, a jerking halt pretty much in the middle of the restaurant. And of course, you think it's an accident. And we began to rise up uh, to go help the people they had knocked over, and we heard gunshots. Um, I was on the passenger side of the, the vehicle, and it was maybe 15 feet away from me. Um, my father and I immediately got down on the floor and put the table, turned the table up on its side in front of us. My mom was down behind us. And the shooting continued. We realized this was 1991, and these mass shootings weren't occurring back then, so it wasn't the first thing that comes to your mind. We were waiting for him to say something like, all right, everybody put your wallets up on the table, or, or something like that. But that didn't happen. He just kept shooting. And when he worked his way around the front of the truck and he was working toward us, a full, I'm going to say 45 seconds had passed, and I realized he was just executing people. And it just 45 seconds, Alex, 45 seconds is an eternity. When I did realize that I reached for my purse that had fallen on the floor next to me, I thought, I've got him. I've got this guy. I used to carry a gun in my purse illegally because an assistant VA out of Houston that was a patient of mine convinced me to carry it illegally. But I did like most people. You know, you think, eh, what are the odds? If I need a gun, it's going to be if I break down on a back road somewhere. It's sure as heck not going to be in a crowded restaurant in the middle of the day. But my gun was 100 yards away in my car where I had begun dutifully leaving it. So uh, long story short, at that point, my dad started to break free from my grip and said, I've got to do something, and I've got to do something. He's going to kill everybody in here. And he made a run at the guy, and the guy just turned and, and shot my father in the chest. Um, <laughs> again, try, I apologize. I'm trying to make it a short story. I know. Um, it's important. You, thank you for sharing it. it, it the, the good news with that, my dad was my dad was mortally wounded. I mean, he had covered maybe half the distance. He was seven, eight feet from me, uh, but he was still alive. It, the good thing about that was it made the gunman change directions, and he had to go off to my left instead of continuing directly toward me. Um, what, it, somebody way at the back of the restaurant broke out on one of the windows back there and began to get escape through that window. People were able to escape that way. We were kind of up in a front corner and couldn't get out. Um, when I saw what I thought was a chance, the gunman had his back turned toward me. I stood up. I grabbed my mother by the shirt collar. I said, come on, come on. We've got to run. We've got to get out of here. And my feet grew wings. And um, to circle 
went back around, my, my mom did not follow me out, and I didn't know that until after, literally, I was outside of the, the restaurant. She was staying with your dad, wasn't she? The police officers later told me what happened to her. They said that, uh, and, and a number of them were patients of mine, and, and they took me and my family to lunch uh, about a week later and told us. They said that when they got into the front, um, they saw a woman on her knees um, cradling a, a mortally wounded man. And they didn't know who the gunman was. And they saw this 30-something-year-old man walk up to her. They said he put a gun to her head. She looked up at him, put her head down, and he pulled the trigger. And they said all they had to do was fire a shot into the ceiling, and this guy rabbited to a back bathroom alcove area. And as you said, exchanged a little gunfire with him and then put a bullet in his own head. My parents had just had their 47th wedding anniversary a couple of weeks prior to this, and it just didn't occur to me while I was running, Mom... Mom wasn't going anywhere without Dad. So I was really angry, Alex. I was really, I was really angry. I felt very guilty. Um, I was, I was very angry. I know people think I made this up later, but you can check the, the newspapers from the second day. I said I was angry at my legislators because they had legislated me out of the right to protect myself and my family. And you can say, well, Susanna, you could have missed. Yeah, I could have. Your gun could have jammed. Well, okay, it's possible. It was a revolver. Not likely, but it's possible. But the one thing you can't argue with is it would have changed the odds. I can't begin to tell you how frustrating it is to sit there and wait for it to be your turn and, and having no way, no means of defending yourself. I can't imagine being in that position again and having my children or my grandchildren with me and having no way of defending them makes me physically ill. Well, we now have countless cases since you went public back in 91, 92, 93, where people have at churches and everywhere else stopped gunmen. Just happened down in San Antonio. It's just happened other places just <laughs> since uh, the Sandy Hook shooting. And the media will not cover it nationally. And we see these countless local news videos of gunmen coming in trying to shoot people for no reason at shops and concealed carry folks that know how to use them take them out and i see the gun grabbers rushing in to try to ban guns right now because they know the gun culture and the self-defense culture is taking over society all the top rated tv shows women out buying guns liberal women's magazines you know show women with guns now um, not, not because they want guns the liberal owners but because they realize women have woken up they're losing that's why they're launching this offensive against the second amendment uh, would you like to elaborate on that statement do you agree or disagree i i agree with you but i do think that, that they see an opportunity um here because of the the connecticut shooting you know it's so hard for any of us to uh imagine that all those little children being just just executed like that it's just when you, you want you want a way and they put the guilt on to us have you ever seen such demonization of gun owners where they say we're clan uh yeah. we're, we're yeah. nazis we 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 helped kill those children when it was a gun-free zone and the media yeah. advertising crazies go to schools and kill people if anybody has blood on their hands it's them isn't that the truth? That's something that I've advocated for for years is for teachers to be able to carry. And, of course, here in Texas, individual schools can make that decision. My school does not allow the teachers to carry. But I can tell you that I know a few that carry anyway. They just keep their mouth shut and do it, thank God. You know, the, the, the bad guys, I don't know why people don't get this. Bad guys like that want a high body bag count. They're going to go where they think they can shoot as many people as possible without anybody shooting back at them. Nobody <laughs> knows these cowards yeah. like you. Uh, you uh, no doubt your father saved your life. Nobody knows these these evil people like you, uh, Susanna Hupp, a survivor of the Libby's Massacre here with us, and, and, and really, you know, the, the grandmother of the concealed carry movement, uh, no doubt, not to use the term grandmother like she's old, but she's the person that really started it. Uh, thank God and save countless lives. Why do these cowards always commit suicide as soon as the cops show up? I mean, it just shows they really are ghoulish demons that they all act exactly the same. You know, I'm, I'm trying to teach my children. I have two boys, 16 and 14. And um, I think 
society in general tries to teach people that that um, that these bad guys are just misunderstood or they've had a hard life or you know all the various and sundry excuses that you can come up with for them. Um, I mean, I, I've actually literally had people ask me, "Why didn't you try to talk the guy down?" Like, really? I mean, I can't even argue with that. It's such a stupid statement. Yeah, just shot your dad in the chest, and then you're going to go talk to him. <laughs> let, me, let me go talk to this guy about his childhood. Um, what I'm trying to teach my children is that, you know, there there certainly are um, criminals. I, I would say the vast majority of criminals in the world that were created. You know, they, they did have bad childhoods and whatnot. But there's also evil. I honestly believe there is absolute evil that exists in the world. That's and my next evil. point. Have you noticed that with Son of Sam, uh, Ramirez, the Night Stalker, uh, Harrison Kleibold, uh, Lanza, and the guy that just shot the firefighters, they were all admitted devil worshipers. Shouldn't no, we did, be profiling I them? I, I did not know that, but I'm not even slightly surprised. Um, may, okay, maybe mildly surprised, but not shocked. How about that? It's incredible. Um, the evil exists. And, and I believe that you must do your best to stand between uh, evil and, and innocent people. And it doesn't mean, again, I want to make this clear because, you know, I'll tell you what one of my biggest fears is, Alex. I, one of my biggest fears is that I'm going to be in some position that I get shot and killed by a bad guy and I'm not able to get a, get a, a round off for some reason. And I'm so afraid that the other side is going to say, see? Her gun didn't help her. And I've, I've said it a million times. It's not a guarantee. It changes the odds. It means you're not a helpless prey animal to be fed upon by devil worshipers and psychopaths. At least I'm not going to be an easy target. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to do my best to bloody them. You know, they might take me out, but I'm going to do my best to put them in the hospital. At the very least, everybody's going to know who the bad guy is. Here's the headline, Daily Mail. It's also in AP. I am the devil. Former classmate reveals school gunman had online devil worshiping page. As childhood barber recounts, how he never spoke and just stared at floors. And that's the uh, shooter of the uh, firefighters with Lanza. Uh, it's the same story. Uh, so uh, this just goes on and on. So all of them. Uh, devil worshipers. Here it is. Satan worship. Uh, the Sandy, uh, you, you know, hook. On and on and on. Son of Sam, Night Stalker. List goes on and on. It's amazing. You know, in the time we have here, because I know you've got to go, Sam. Maybe you can do five more minutes with us after the break to talk about your book, which I need to carry at the Infowars online bookstore because I know it's so important. We all need to reach out to the dumbed down people that really think turning their guns in is going to protect them, but. Uh, looking at uh, Diane Feinstein, have you seen the testimony in Congress where she admits she has a concealed carry but doesn't want well, you to be I, able? I, I have seen um, uh, written quotes from it, but I have not actually seen it, no. It's amazing, though. I mean, how can they all have bodyguards and she can be worth $100 billion bucks, but then we're not supposed to have guns? <laughs> I remember being on uh, CNN or one of those shows when uh, Rosie O'Donnell, uh, there had been some incident with one of her adopted children, and a, a bodyguard protected the child. You know, and I went on the air and said, oh, she must be horribly, horribly, uh, um, feel awfully silly at the moment because she's telling all of us to disarm, and most of us don't have her kind of money that we can hire personal bodyguards for our kids. And she must be terribly embarrassed. But I feel that way pretty much about fine sign and most of them. It's just an elitist attitude. It's okay for me, but it's not for you because I don't trust you. Well, if you notice, I've even got Christian Science Monitor admitting, I have an article that our government's trying to restrict free speech online and going the way of China. Uh, I've got an article after you leave us, we're going to go over where top Georgetown professors saying, yeah, go ahead and kill old people, death panels. Uh, I mean, they're not just going after the Second Amendment. Do you see it as a big canary in the coal mine? that they are this open and brazen right now? I, I, here's what I really think, Alex. Um, I don't think Obama is the problem. I don't think Feinstein is the problem. I honestly believe that our public education system is the problem. 
Because those are the people that are growing up to run for office that think socialism and Marxism is a good thing. They're the ones that grow up and vote for the Obamas and the Feinstein. So I, I, I truly believe, you know, you and I tend to attack this, and a lot, of, uh, a lot of partisans tend to attack this at the top. You know, well, we have to get so-and-so out of office or into office. And, and I really hold that the problem is uh, down in the school system. Have we crossed the Rubicon of becoming a collectivist society where they've got so many people domesticated, you know, yeah. they're, they're like squirrels you feed in your backyard after a while. They don't know how to go out and get their own food. Yes, yes. Yeah, I was talking about this last night on the radio show, in fact, uh, on the one that I was filling in on in Austin. Uh, um, yes, I, I unfortunately, I, I think we have hit the tipping point. I And I think that's evidenced uh, in this last... Um, um, presidential run. She just said people in Texas or other more constitutional areas where the economy, by the way, is still operating because we're not socialist completely are in a bubble. We think, oh, they'll never have government-run health care. They'll never make us pay for abortions. They'll never take over the Catholic Church and make them pay for abortions. It's all happening. They'll never do this. They'll never do that. Really, they've done this in every other country. They're following a model. And there are powerful corporate interests that want monopolies. They want a quasi-socialist system with a fascist system on top of it. And there's also some hoaxing going on where they say this is a mandate for socialism because Obama won again. No, they ran a neocon socialist Obamacare writing Mitt Romney. So the fix is in is the problem. Uh, Representative, I wanted to talk about your book some, but first, solutions. If we have reached the, the tipping point of domestication, we know the solution is wait till it rots and collapses like the Soviet Union. Well, that's going to be authoritarianism. I don't want to be sent to the Gulag Archipelago. How do we short circuit it before it gets really, really bad? <laughs> well, um, you're not going to like my answer. I, I guess I guess my answer has, is two parts. Number one, we truly, truly need to get into these school systems and begin to reteach what made America great, because they're not teaching it now. They're teaching that socialism and Marxism is good. The what do you mean I don't like your answer? Uh, I mean, I love, I mean, absolutely. And, and, and look, the government's taken over. It's time for us to do what the socialists did. I think people should infiltrate government uh, and do whatever you have to to get in there to report on these people and sabotage yes. these people. Yes, yes, that's very well put. Well, I said that uh, you wouldn't like it because, unfortunately, you know, it's not a... It's not a glamorous answer, and it's, it's a slow task to changes in the school system. The second thing that you do brilliantly is teach people to be prepared. And, I, you know, it used to be only us crazies that would, <laughs> that would stockpile food or stockpile water or ammunition or whatever, but now they actually have television shows about it. You know, it's not just crazies. It's not just people that are missing for their front teeth. You know? But our grandparents all did that. It's normal. All mammals, you know, store some food. I mean, even grasshoppers do it, and they're insects. I mean, uh, you're crazy to just live day to day in some supermax prison style grid. Let me ask you this, and we'll talk about the book and let you go, and hopefully get you back soon. Uh, I have a clip in my film Endgame Blueprint for Global Enslavement. And in it, it's you talking to the head of the Psychiatry Association, and you say, Why are 60. 7% at that time of, of foster kids on psychotropics. And you were heading up the committee and there was a big investigation. And he says, oh, they come from bad gene pools. Well, A, that's what Hitler said. B, they don't even do blood tests, quote, gene pools. Uh, I mean, no, they grab kids from their parents and then drug them, as doctors have said. What do you make of that? That's not liberal drugging kids. That's, that's evil. Yes, and in many, many, many cases, uh, those children were on more than three psychotropic drugs, and many of them weren't even okay for children of the age that uh, they were giving them to. Um, I, I, I'm deeply concerned with the drug culture, and I don't want to, look, I don't want to badmouth all drugs. Look, I just got off a run of antibiotics for a sinus infection. But there are good drugs out there. The problem is, it is... This is one of the, the things that can be tricky in a free society. We do have these, these uh, enormous uh, drug companies that push this stuff and actually get it wrapped into the government system to where the, the doctors that are working on the foster kids, for instance, have to follow a particular protocol, you know, and what, what drugs they use. They can't deviate from that protocol. So there, 
there it's it's very interconnected and, and very difficult to unravel, quite frankly. Well, that's right. In the public schools, it turns out, get more federal funding, the more kids are, quote, special need on the drugs. In fact, the WOAI investigation that spurred the state investigation, if you remember, found that the national average was 67% of foster children are on psychotropics, and the average child was on seven drugs Yes. Seven drugs. So Yeah, which is crazy. I mean, that in and of itself is crazy. And that there is absolutely, my husband is a, is a neuropsychologist, so I, I would go to him and use him uh, uh, for information on a regular basis. And uh, it, you're right. Unfortunately, there is a financial benefit to not only um, the school system, but the parents. There was a kind of a, a, a negative um Basically, they would go in, and a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them would go in and say, well, this kid's creating a lot of problems for me. He really needs to be on medication. Somebody would put him on medication, and the foster family would get more money per day because of it. And then yeah. the medication makes them worse, so the answer is not get them off drugs, get yeah. them on more. They're eating Twinkies, they're drinking Cokes yeah. with caffeine, they're, yeah. they're eating, I mean, my children, if they get red dye or something in a candy, you know, on vacation we let them eat it or something, or, they go, or, nuts, or don't they? they go crazy. And then it turns <laughs> out those dyes have a drug effect. The kids are bouncing off the walls because they should be eating steak and potatoes and broccoli and exercising all day. Instead, I mean, if I drank Cokes and ate Twinkies, when I come down yeah. off of it, I've done it a few times. I've, I want to beat the hell out of people. I mean, I mean, no wonder the kids. Particularly young boys. Instead of, well, I mean, it used to amaze me to watch the teachers. They they were taught to give the little boys time out. Instead of instead of what they should be doing is telling them to go outside and run around the school five times. Well, you know, public schools first got rid of dodgeball. Now most of them have banned j running. Uh, so, so, I mean, of course, young mammals. I mean, that'd be like drugging a puppy because it runs around and chews on the other puppy. I mean, yeah. baby mammals all act the same. same. Ma'am, you're amazing. Thank you for your time, and thank you for getting your testimony out there uh, that the answer is uh, uh, more guns, less crime. Tell us briefly about your book. Um, I wrote that book for, for the average person um, to read and be able to make the arguments uh, with their neighbors and friends. It's also a great book to pass on. You know who I really wrote that book for? I wrote that book for housewives that just aren't sure how they feel about guns. You know, they're not into, be, into going out and blasting Bambi, and, and they're just uncomfortable with things that go make a loud bang. And I understand that. I completely understand that. And I'm a mother, and I've been there. I understand. I'm not into going out and blasting Bambi either. But it's a quick, easy read, and it's for those people. Absolutely. Well, you know, you've got two sons. I've got two daughters and a son, and I love them like life itself or more. But it is really a good feeling now that my eight-year-old is shooting and, and, and hitting bullseye at 50 yards. Oh, we haven't trained the four-year-old yet. And it's such a good feeling that my girls are tough. Sometimes they punch me when we're playing, and it really hurts. And that they're not putting up with anybody trying to rape them or attack them. And that I'm going to defend the Second Amendment so when they go off to college or when they get married and they live, some guy bust into their apartment or into their house to try to beat them up or rape them, they're dead. And that's yeah. real empowerment. And it's, it's not feminism. It's, it's, it's survival. It's, it's basic common sense. And as I said... Our culture of liberty, the women's magazines, the Austin Chronicle has been having articles about women shooting, not because the socialist anti-American Chronicle, run by a horrible guy who I know, uh, wants to do that. They're being forced to do that if people are going to pick up their magazines. And our culture of liberty and self-empowerment is growing, and so that's why the empire is striking back. And your book breaks that down, and I hope everybody gets it and gives it to women who are anti-gun in their family or who are on the fence. Thank you very much. All right. Well, have a great uh, week coming up, and uh, I always enjoy getting to hear you on 590 AM when you're filling in. God bless. Thank you very much. Happy New Year. Well, that's all for today's newscast. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow evening. And remember, Alex is going to be on CNN's Pierce Morgan Show right now, 8 p.m. Central.